Milton Erickson's teaching tales, the stories he told his patients, and the stories he told the pilgrims who came to sit at his feet, are ingenious and enchanting. They are extraordinary examples of the art of persuasion. Some people would say that they are much too good to be tucked away on the psychiatry shelf, since even though their intention was therapeutic, they are part of a much larger tradition, the American tradition of wit and humor, whose greatest exemplar is Mark Twain. I first became aware of the amazing exploits of Erickson when I began to work as a writer and editor at the Mental Research Institute in Palo Alto in 1963. I was putting together the material for the book Techniques of Family Therapy with Jay Haley. Haley, who had taped hours of conversation with Erickson, told me story after story about him while I listened entranced. This was part of my initiation into the field of family therapy, and it made a big impact on me. It is all the more an honor then, 18 years later, to be asked to write the foreword to Sidney Rosen's compilation of Erickson's teaching tales. Because of the curious way Erickson stands on the line between healer and poet, scientist and bard, it is difficult to describe his work. Transcripts of his seminars, though wonderful, are to some extent unsatisfying. The written words simply cannot convey the pauses, smiles, and piercing upward glances with which Erickson punctuates his narratives, nor can it record his mastery of. The written word, in short, cannot give any idea of the way Erickson insinuates himself. Sidney Rosen has solved this problem, although I am not sure how he has done it. Erickson chose him as disciple, as colleague, and as friend to edit this volume. His intuition, as usual, was correct. Rosen has a way of taking you by the hand and insinuating you into Erickson's presence. There seems to be no obstruction. I once watched an underwater swimming show in Florida. The audience sat in an underground amphitheater that was separated by a pane of glass from a limestone spring. The water was so clear and transparent that the fish that swam close to the glass seemed to be gliding through air. Reading this book was a similar experience perhaps because Rosen gives us such a strong sense of the relational field that was Erickson's own natural medium. The first line of the first chapter is a remark from Erickson to Rosen on the nature of the unconscious. Just as Erickson weaves into his tales reminiscences, personal biography, odd thoughts, or unusual facts, so Rosen weaves into his commentary bits about this or that personal encounter with Erickson, associations to some particular tale, and ways he himself has used these stories in his own work with patients. And he also gives a running explication of the various techniques exemplified by the tales. The commentary is the relational field in which the stories are suspended. In addition, Rosen seems to be speaking, not writing, again paralleling Erickson, and his style is friendly and non-technical. It is also quite plain. Whether deliberately or not, Rosen creates a frame that is neutral enough to highlight the color and brilliance of the stories. Nevertheless, the totality transcends the effect of any one element. Thoughtful attention is paid to each anecdote, and a skilled and experienced hypnotherapist, who himself is a gifted practitioner of Ericksonian techniques, gives us a book that is, in effect, a teaching tale about a teaching tale. Let me give a sense here of the way the commentary flows in and out of the tales. Taking the first part of chapter three, trust the unconscious as my source. This chapter begins with a short anecdote about Erickson's having to give a speech on the spur of the moment and saying to himself that he didn't have to prepare because he had confidence in the storehouse of ideas and experience he had built up over the years. Rosen underlines this theme of trust in one's unconsciously stored powers and then includes a short vignette, Light Snow, haunting in its simplicity, about a childhood memory and the memory of when that memory was laid down. This story is followed by two more on the same theme. The last story is about Erickson's not talking when he was four, and his mother saying to people made uncomfortable by this fact, when the time arrives, then he will talk. Rosen cuts back in briefly to say that this story is a good one to use with patients just learning how to go into trance. The next story is splendid. It is called Scratching Hogs. It describes a time when Erickson, who as a young man sold books to pay his way through college, was trying to sell some to a crusty old farmer. The man isn't having any and tells Erickson to go about his business. Erickson, without thinking, picks up some shingles from the ground and starts scratching the backs of the hogs the farmer is feeding. 
the farmer changes his mind and agrees to buy Erickson's books because, as he says, you know how to scratch hogs. This is followed by Rosen's commenting on the story and moving on to the occasion when he first heard it, after he had asked Erickson why he chose Rosen to write the foreword to his book, Hypnotherapy. After explaining just what things about Rosen had made him wish to entrust the writing of a foreword to him, Erickson added, I like the way you scratch a hog. This fragment gives an idea of the tapestried richness of the book. Each tale is treated as a precious object in a collection, full, four of memories. And Rosen shares with the reader the different meanings they evoke for him, both as a person and as a clinician. If I were a canny fellow like that farmer, I would buy this book. Sidney Rosen does know how to scratch a hog. Ackerman Institute of Family Therapy, Editor's Note. 